Welcome everyone to our webinar today. My name is Ian Trevoranis. I'm the product line manager for Haribas Particle Products. I'll be hosting the webinar today. Dr. Jeff Bodycomb, one of our product managers, will be presenting about a 30 to 40 minute presentation on the uh, effortless emulsion evaluation for everyone. This webinar was brought to you by the letter E and by viewers like you. Okay, Ian. Well, uh, thank you for the introduction. And as Ian mentioned, we're going to talk about evaluating emul emulsions. And pretty much this talk is really how to use uh, some particle analysis instruments to characterize emulsions. Um, I, I think some of you are, are interested in some related topics, uh, particularly some details of formulation and co-surfactants. We're not going to go into that, um, although you certainly can measure the effect of co-surfactants. Factors, uh, looking at things like particle size and data potential. Um, you know, so primarily this is a discussion of uh, liquid, liquid emulsions. So kind of an outline. I'm going to talk about what is an emulsion, uh, then measuring size by laser diffraction followed by measuring size with dynamic light scattering, which is a different size measurement technique, and finally measuring charge on the droplets using zeta potential analysis. So just to get some definitions, um, what it is in the motion, it's a mixture of two immiscible liquids, such as oil and water. So I have the classic picture um, required for all emulsion talks about a bottle of olive oil and some water and trying to get the two mixed. You also need an emulsifier. So what is an emulsifier? So you imagine you have droplets of water in oil, um, or vice versa, and the, those droplets are going to have quite a high surface area, and there's a surface, ener uh, surface energy or a penalty associated with having that area. And so these droplets are not going to remain particularly stable. Uh, so you can use, use emulsifiers to reduce the surface energy or surface tension. There, there are a few ways to do it. There are a few examples where uh, you know, the, one, one of the phases is its only emulsifier. So if you think about vinegar, that kind of stays in oil a little bit uh, because the, the vinegar acts as an emulsifier. Uh, often though, you're, you start adding other materials. And so if you think about an emulsion droplet, which I've shown here, you might add a surfactant with an oil. You know, so this is oil. I have an oily tail and a polar head. So this is negatively charged. And there's a counter ion wandering off somewhere. And you have a bunch of these around the surface of the droplet. And what, they, what these do is they effectively present an oily surface to the, uh, to the uh, oily phase and a polar surface to the aqueous phase. And so the surface energy um, of this droplet becomes very, very small. So you don't have to worry about that issue anymore. And the same idea is shown schematically here with a green oil droplet in water. And I show the uh, cations floating around in the suspension. When you start to think about emulsions, it's important to think about what else is going on in the liquid. So what are some examples of emulsions? Well, lots of foods are emulsion. You're, you're trying to mix up uh, aqueous proteins and fats, both of which the body needs in varying ratios. Uh, and so you think about things like salad dressing or mayonnaise or butter. Um, and OK, so mayonnaise is actually an oil and water emulsion with a very high particle concentration. Uh, butter is water and oil and the other way around. You also see things like flavoring uh, and flavor concentrates that exist as emulsions. The flavoring compounds are really oily, but you want to carry them in water. Also, you can think about uh, pharma and personal care. You think about things like lotions and creams or for drug delivery. So if you want to get something that is nonpolar into the body in, in an aqueous carrier, you're going to start thinking about forming an emulsion.
Well, uh, food's a great example because it's kind of fun chemistry and you can generally eat your results. And that, uh, particularly if you pick things like ice cream, that's a great, great experience. Uh, but industrially, you see emulsions a lot. You can think about drilling fluid. And I was digging around for this. And I stumbled across an article from M.I. Sueco, now Schlumberger, where they have a reversible oil water emulsion that as they change pH, it seems to flip from oil and water to water and oil emulsion. So it, it actually changes back and forth. And um, that does good things for, for oil well drillers. Another example is cutting fluid. Now, if you're machining a part and you're running your tool at high speed, you're going to get everything hot, and that's not good for precision machining, so you want water to get rid of the heat. You also like water because it's environmentally friendly. You also need some oil to lubricate your, cut, your cutting head to extend tool life. So, well, you can't feed oil and water into the part and expect them both to be effective if they're not mixed effectively. And so you start looking at emulsions for cutting fluids. At the end of the day, though, what you wind up with from various processes, um, including the two drilling, uh, drilling wells and machining, but a lot of other industrial processes, you'll find out that you have a waste stream that includes oil droplets. They're emulsified. Now, if you have a mixture of oil and water, you just let the oil flow to the top or sink to the bottom and you skim it off or pump it out the bottom and you have relatively clean water. Uh, but if you have a bunch of tiny oil or droplets in the water, it looks terrible. It's not good for the fish and they're very hard to get rid of because you can spend a long time waiting for them to float. So you really want to break that emulsion and cause the oil particles to flocculate and so become larger and therefore uh, cream to the top or sink to the bottom more quickly. And so you'll want to know how to manipulate these emulsions, even if they're a bit messy. So emulsions go both ways. Sometimes we like them, and sometimes we don't. Let me comment real quickly on emulsion polymers. You'll hear about emulsion polymers that are, when you actually receive them, and they're all done being made, they're suspensions of polymer particles in a liquid. Um, but they're not really liquid-liquid emulsions. One step in a preparation is a preparation of an oil, really a monomer and water emulsion, and then the polymerization reaction occurs, and that's where the name comes from. But the behavior of emulsion polymers is somewhat different from the behavior of, say, an oil and water emulsion. So what are some things that we care about? Well, droplet size comes up. It, um, and and it's, it has all sorts of effects on the behavior of emulsions. So when you think about food, it affects the mouth feel and the flavor for food. So how, how it feels in, on your tongue really depends on the particle size. Uh, it affects kinetics or, or any chemistry going on that is mediated by the surface. Uh, so if you imagine, uh, well, we'll use flavor, you have flavor droplets, if you will, in water. Uh, how fast does that flavoring agent get from the droplet to your tongue? Or how fast does the drug get from the droplet out into the rest, into your stomach? Is going to depend on the surface area or surface to volume ratio, and that depends on droplet size. Droplet size can also affect suspension viscosity, or I should say emulsion viscosity. Emulsion appearance, as the droplets get larger, you'll start to see cloudiness. And stability, um, particularly there are a range of sizes that will affect the Ostwald ripening um, or transfer of oily material from uh, smaller particles to larger ones. Now surface charge is also important particularly as we think about things like suspension stability. So how do we measure size? Well, there are two choices that I'm going to talk about today. Both are based on light scattering, but on very different physics. And the first is laser diffraction. So uh, laser diffraction, we have 
a uh, semiconductor laser on the right side of the screen. It's focused effectively on the sample here in the middle with this flow cell. And then we look at the scattering with a number of detectors. You see them arranged about the sample, primarily in the forward angle, um, and with several in, in backwards angles as well. And what we're going to do is look at the uh, effect of um, scatter intensity as a function of scattering angle. So let me see, I got my slides out of order, sorry for that. So the, the effect, here I have a plot showing scatter intensity on the y-axis and the scattering angle on the x-axis. And these are some model calculations. And what you really see is you go from the blue, which are the largest particles, to the black, 10 micron, to green, 1 micron particles, that there are all these peaks and valleys. So if you look at these peaks and valleys, you can infer the size distribution by matching them up to um, these scattering patterns. So what you, you match, what, take what you measure and match it up to these mathematical models, and that will give you a particle size distribution. Now, what are you measuring? Well, laser diffraction really gives you the diameter of a sphere that scatters the same way as your sample. So I'll try to show that with these three examples here. The first is a sphere with a, a core with a hairy shell, uh, and a hairy shell doesn't scatter particularly strongly. And so what you really obtain is a size that is pretty close to the core size, for the particle size. If you think about groups of particles, so let's say your emulsion starts to flocculate, what you're really going to measure is the size of these droplets that have started to coalesce. And if your droplets are not spherical, then you're going to see kind of an average size. And so this is a good thing to keep in mind when interpreting your data, and particularly when comparing to the results from dynamic light scattering. What are some example measurements? This is a water and oil emulsion coming out of the oil industry. On the left, I show a micrograph uh, with, a photo, with, with the droplets that were being measured. And you can see that each division is 10 microns, so you see a bunch of stuff that's around 5 microns. Uh, and then you can look at the main graph, which is the size distribution um, obtained by laser diffraction. And that's really two different samples, so I have uh, six, three repeats of each, and they overlay quite nicely. Uh, the left axis, which you can't see, is, is the differential size distribution, the right axis is cumulative. And so you can see that the photo micrograph matches the diffraction. We see about five micron particles, actually, this is two, three, four, yeah, five micron particles in the peak, and with some big ones with that tail extending past 10 microns. The second sample shows a larger size. Unfortunately, I don't have micrographs for that one. Um, here is another example. This is a form of emulsion with, with a um, bimodal distribution. This is another water and oil emulsion. We use the fraction cell for small sample volume. Another nice thing about the fraction cell is it's made of glass, and so it's quite chemically resistant, um, which is useful to keep in mind when you have your continuous phases in oil. And once again, we get the, these two different sizes. And I don't know how that bimodal uh, distribution was made, whether it was uh, some particular selection of surfactants or the shear or if that was just a impurity or processing error with the uh, 15 micron particles. Okay, this is an oil and water emulsion of a lotion and so you have a differential size distribution. Here we're getting to sizes well below 100 nanometers and so 10, 9, about 80 nanometers. Second repeat, I get just an exact overlay of the curves. If I look at the median size, you can see it changes out in the uh, 
uh, fourth decimal place. So we have almost exactly the same result. Measure again. Again, very tiny change in the result. So we have almost exact overlays for these three repeats. We can also compare a variety of lotion formulas, which I show here. And so once again, the diameter is the x-axis. The left side shows differential, and the right side the cumulative distribution. OK, I'm going to pause here for a pop quiz. So the okay. So what you can see as the question is: laser diffraction can be used to measure. And I want you to go ahead and fill out what you think it's measured: oil and water emulsions, water and oil emulsions, emotional emulsions, and any emulsion. Okay, um, as someone has asked, I, um, I guess we'll start to cover this, if you have emulsions with different solvents, and uh, you can see that in the hint in the answer to the questions, which is, if you start looking at things that are not uh, aqueous, then you need to check chemical compatibility of your system. So I think most of you have voted, so I'm going to close that. And I think the vast majority of you have passed the pop quiz, which means probably nothing in the grand scheme of things. Um, so let me shift back to the uh, slideshow. Yeah, so um, building in. Building instruments with chemically resistant parts these days is fairly easy, but somewhat more expensive because uh, you have to go and obtain these parts with more exotic materials. So if you're using an existing instrument that's only been used with aqueous systems in the past, you want to investigate that point carefully. You always feel a bit silly if you dissolve some tubing and create a mess. Um, if you're purchasing a new instrument, you want to discuss chemical compatibility with your supplier. Um, so Haribo will manufacture various flavors of instrument according to what you need to measure. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's another question is, you know, how can you interpret or understand size from irregular particles? Well, uh, you know, so if you have aggregates or spherically mild dispersed particles, so if they're mild dispersed, you'll see a very narrow size distribution. If you have uh, aggregates, aggregates tend to be, have a range of particle sizes, but you can't differentiate between aggregates that are stuck to, loosely stuck together and primary particles by scattering alone. What you can do is use uh, different dispersion techniques, including adding energy to the system uh, to see if the measured particle size changes. And uh, you know, with, with 950, what we have some uh, built-in tools in the method expert just to kind of automate that entire process. So you just look at variation in size with amount of ultrasound, for example. Okay, next I want to talk about dynamic light scattering. And dynamic light scattering is a somewhat different measurement. What we ha what we have is a laser now it's on the left side of the screen, shining into a sample. This is a top view with the particles. And then I'm going to look at, at the scattering at a single angle. So instead of looking at the um, scattering as a function of scattering angle, I look at the scattering as a function of time at one angle. The raw signal I obtain is random, and it basically looks like noise. So this is an example, um, actually I generated this as an ideal 
random signal, if you will. And the reason you have this random signal is not because of noise in the electronics or the optics, but because of random changes in the particle position. These random changes come about due to something known as Brownian motion. So we can interpret these random changes in something known as an autocorrelation function, or using something known as an autocorrelation function, and relate that to particle size. Um, so the key point here is that we're looking at the particle motion and we'll report the size of a sphere that moves or diffuses the same way as your sample. So going back to my examples before, if I have that hairy uh, sphere or that decorated particle, I'm going to see not just the core, but in, in addition the shell around it of you know, these hairs, even if they don't scatter particularly strongly or even if they don't appear in electron microscopy. Uh, also, and once again, if you have uh, aggregates or associated material, you're going to obtain the size of these aggregates or flocks, not the size of these individual particles. And again, if you want to differentiate, you'll have to look at different chemical or energy, energetic mechanisms for separating them. And finally, if the particle is not quite round, uh, say it's ellipsoidal, we're still going to obtain the size of a sphere. Making the measurement um, is fairly straightforward. Basically, in dynamic light scattering, you're going to fill a sample cell, stuff it into the instrument in step two, and step three, press start. This is similar to laser diffraction, where you tell the instrument to fill the cell with, with your bulk of your liquid, you add your sample with an eyedropper, and then you press start. So both measurements are fairly quick and simple. You wait a minute or two, and then you review the results. Uh, with dynamic light scattering, uh, it's much easier because uh, to think of chemical compatibility because the sample cells are small and easily exchanged. And so a staring instrument will come with both a glass cell and plastic cells. And you just have to think a bit before you make your measurement when you go to fill your cell up. Uh, quick hint, if you have a sample that is in something like THF and you put it into a plastic cell and then put it into your instrument, if the THF dissolves the plastic before you take it out of your instrument, you're going to have a really bad mess. So take a few seconds to think about that. So here's a somewhat a different flavor emulsion, and these are repeats on the same material. Uh, this is aqueous emulsion, so I have an oily flavor, uh, flavoring agent dispersed in water. And you can see that I have a particle size at 200, 300, about 350 nanometers or so. I get fairly nice repeatability, not quite as what I get from laser diffraction. I'm not sure if that's due to the sample, um, there, and some of it's due to the technique. I can readily compare three different flavor emulsions and see quite dramatic differences. Uh, these were actually three different flavors I could tell because they each smelled a little bit different. And so, um, you know, one, I forget, one was lemony, one was orangey. Oh, and of course, the customer labeled them things like A, B, and C. Uh, so I can't tell you much much about them. Now, another common question is I've just shown you two techniques, dynamic light scattering and diffraction. You might say, well, which do I use? Well, we actually look at this question a fair amount. Uh, and so if I take a, the flavor emulsions and I compare the two, I'd say take a sample and move it from one instrument to the next, measure exactly the same sample, I can plot the size obtained by dynamic light scattering as a function of the size, median size obtained by laser diffraction. And what you see is, is there's a nice neat one-to-one -one relationship between the two. Now, I show the median diameter obtained by dynamic light scattering, which is closer mathematically to median obtained by laser diffraction, and I also show the Z average diameter obtained by dynamic light scattering. The Z average is a 
more stable answer, and so we like to use that. Note that both numbers increase as the particle size increases. So we're measuring slightly different things, and so we expect the results to differ, and they do. And that still begs the question of which to use. Uh, so you're going to first let me advise you if you're going to look at one material uh, for quality control, then choose one technique and stick with it. Uh, a second bit of advice is if you're going to use dynamic light scattering, stick with the Z averages. They tend to be a bit more repeatable. But the most important question comes down to what other sizes do you want to measure? And quite often you talk to a customer and they hand you a 100 nanometer sample. Both instruments do quite well with that sample. And then they say, well, by the way, you know, we have some other stuff that's about 5 microns or 10 microns. And once, they, once someone says that, you know that they're a strong candidate for dynamic light. I'm sorry, strong candidate for laser diffraction. So once you get over into many, many microns, you'll be much happier with laser diffraction, which is less affected by things like uh, particles selling or creaming, or I should say uh, second phase droplets selling or creaming. You know, so it's always an option to see the results from both techniques and to decide which makes the most sense for your process and, and so on. Well, I think some of you want to understand how to manipulate emulsions or understand what you can do to measure surface charge and use that to manipulate emulsions. I'm going to talk about that in the last. So we'll talk about zeta potential. Zeta potential is the surface charge at the shear plane. So if you imagine your droplet moving through this through the liquid, it's going to be, it's going to move along with some bits of solvent and some a cl cloud of counter ions, if you will. And this all the stuff that moves together is enclosed in the imaginary surface known as a shear plane. Um, we're going to look at the surface charge at that point. Now it's been found through experience that if the, that charge, which is known as the zeta potential, has a large magnitude, either positive or negative, it will lead to a stable suspension. That's because the droplets are, repel each other electrostatically and therefore don't want to join together and form large flocks or coalesce into larger particles. If you can neutralize that charge, then the odds of the droplets colliding and coalescing or flocculating become much higher. So quite often, what you want to do is measure the effect of some additive on the zeta potential. So how do you find zeta potential? We have charged droplets that scatter quite strongly, and um, and so because they're charged, if we apply an electric field, then all the droplets will shift towards the opposite electrode. So here I have cationic droplets I'm moving towards a negative electrode, and they're all moving. And I can watch them move by dynamic, by light scattering. So I shine some light on it, and the scattered light has a slight frequency shift. So the optical system I show here, again, I have the laser coming in from the left. Now you see the beam splitter. And so I'm going to take off a reference beam. And I have the scattering at forward angle. And I'm going to send the reference beam in a circle around the sample and then mix it with the scattered light and into my detector. That's going to give me a, um, that's going to give me a power spectrum and so I can pick off the, the Doppler shifts, which are proportional to electrophoretic mobility, which is proportional to zeta potential. This is what the results look like. Generally, people just tabulate the zeta potential value, like I show in the right-hand side. And the software makes it easy for me to shift-click and find the average and standard deviation of a group of measurements. And so that's why I show. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six repeats, which is a lot, of a flavor. Um, an average zeta potential of minus 54, standard deviation of 1 millivolt, 
And so that tells me this is likely to be very stable. And in truth, I've had this suspension on my desk for quite a while, and it is very stable. So the, the prediction is correct. It hasn't, has not separated. So again, nice repeatability and a prediction of what finally happens. Now, zeta potential as an isolated measurement is not very much fun. Um, you, know, you can measure a suspension, say, ah, it has a charge, but what you really are looking for is uh, what conditions gives it a strong negative charge, what conditions give it a strong positive charge, and what conditions give it a nearly zero charge. Well, when I say conditions, I really mean suspension around those droplets. So you can't really talk about zeta potential of a particular material or a particular droplet without talking about what's around it. So here is coffee mate. Coffee mate is probably a favorite sample of zeta potential people because you can find coffee mate just about everywhere. It's the powder that you add to your coffee as kind of a powdered creamer. Uh, coffee mate's a trade name. There are a whole bunch of different brands. Um, and I take my coffee black, so I don't know which tastes better. But I do know that I can access the isoelectric point of most of them. And so for this particular material, I see that at pH 4, the zeta potential is just about zero. And that's known as the isoelectric point. As I go to lower pHs, more acidic, so more proton, H plus, in the um, emulsion that are going to the particle surface, it goes to a positive charge. As I go to high pH and more hydroxides, and the particle surface becomes negatively charged. So you can see that if you want to keep coffee mate from flocculating, you need to operate at either low or higher pHs. Now, another application is when you don't want your emulsion anymore. So you can add something known as a coagulant. What you do is you add polyions to reduce the effect of an emulsifier and break the emulsion or accelerate flocculation. So I've shown this schematically in two cases. On the left side, I have a polycation, so that's that purple string there with some pluses on it, and it's kind of laid itself across a bunch of negative charges on this particle uh, droplet surface, neutralizing the negative charges. On the right, you see a green my green oil droplet, again, with the negative charge surfactant, and I add aluminum sulfate, uh, alum, and so the trivalent aluminum does not want to leave that polyanionic uh, droplet, and so you have a strong negative charge and a strong positive charge, and they stick together. Unlike the hydrogens I drew in there that have gone away because they only have one charge, so all else being equal, they would leave the particle. So really polyvalent ions are big for coagulants. Uh, polycations are also a great choice. You'll see lots of coagulant formulations that are proprietary or somewhat proprietary. You can even pick it up in your drugstore, styptic, uh, for when you cut yourself shaving. And that leads me to a pretest. So the question is, when you're adding coagulate, coagulant to flocculate, flocculate waste, so you have a waste stream, it has droplets, which you really wish weren't there, so you can start adding coagulant from Joe's Coagulant Garage. Well, how much should you add? Here are my choices. More is always better. We'll ignore economics for the moment, although that always comes into play. Less is always better. Just wing it. Nobody's going to notice it's a waste stream, right? And there is an optimal amount. So I'll give everybody a chance to vote. This is a pretest, so it doesn't count against uh, the grade I'm not giving. We'll do it now. Okay, I think everybody who's going to vote has voted, so I'm going to go ahead and close that. And so now most of you 
decide that there's uh, an optimal amount. With a little bit of a cagey question, I should have said somewhere between more is better and less is better. 9% said more is always better, 6% less is always better. Uh, there is actually an optimal amount for many coagulant systems. So here is a refinery wastewater sample. Uh, this was sour water stank up the lab. Uh, and so I, I received this along with a proprietary coagulant, and they wanted to break the emulsion. I made a plot of zeta potential on the left side as a function of parts per million coagulant solids. So uh, one, when I had 0.01 parts per million coagulant solids, the zeta potential of the waste stream, uh, which was an emulsion, was very strongly negative. That was not going anywhere. As I added more 0.1, one part per million, then you start to see the zeta potential becoming less negative and climbing towards zero. And somewhere around 2 ppm, we see a value of zero. But I kept going, and look at what happens. Now I've added so much coagulant, all those polycations have piled on to the particle surface and driven the surface charge positive. Well, this is not doing us any good at all because now the surface charge has gone up to 40 and even 60 millivolts. Uh, the droplets are once again stabilized and you have done nothing to clean up your waste stream or to accelerate any flocculation or coalescence. And so what this tells you is that there is an optimal amount. And you, you do want to make some measurements to ensure that you uh, don't overdose your waste stream with coagulant. And so you want to do some kind of zeta potential study like this um, as your waste stream changes. Uh, the, yeah. Now another point of this slide is, there were a couple of them. One is that sometimes people like large zeta potential values and some people like small zeta potential values. Another is that measuring the effect of other additives on zeta potential is really the way this technique should be used. Now I have a random comment that didn't seem to fit anywhere, but I wanted to mention about dilution. Um, sometimes you'll need to dilute samples for the particle size or zeta potential measurement. If you pay attention to your, your uh, continuous phase ions, that's usually not a problem. What you can do is do a concentration study to check that the measured size doesn't change. I show here a quick concentration study that's possibly the most boring ever. I measure three different concentrations. I measure size just doesn't change all that much with concentration. So I take the middle result, or I take the average of the three, and declare victory, and move on. OK, I think that was 35 minutes. And I think it's time for questions and answers. So if you want to type a question into the chat box or question box, that's great. Uh, or you can email a question if you, they occur to you later to laminfo at hariba.com. We, we have our monthly newsletter. And you can download this webinar later on on our website at hariba.com. OK, thanks very much, Jeff. I wanted to uh, thank you all for attending. And thank you, Jeff, for presenting. Uh, it was very informative. And uh, we, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Okay. And well, hope thank to see you, you at the next webinar. Much. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.